Good afternoon and welcome to Orkney International Science Festival 2021 and this year of Scotland's coasts and waters. My name is Julie Rich and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session from sunny Orkney. This afternoon we will be returning to Greenland to Disco Bay, home to large plankton concentrations, a food source of the bowhead whales who travel thousands of miles to feed there every spring. Our speaker, Dr. Neil Banas, will be looking at why the plankton concentrate there and whales future given the ice melt from microscopic level to large scale ocean circulation. Dr. Neil Banas, an oceanographer and mathematical ecologist comes to us from Strathclyde University in Glasgow. Neil moved to Scotland in 2015 from the US and has been exploring both histories and futures of European seas and the Arctic Ocean. I'm very happy to hand over to Dr. Neil Banas and his lecture on whales and the changing Arctic. Hello, Neil. Thanks, Julie. And thanks everyone for coming. It's a real pleasure to be here and um, have the chance to share with you all some of the things I've been learning about as an oceanographer working with a variety of marine biologists, uh, many of whose names you see there. Um, and thanks also to the UK Research Council's Changing Arctic Ocean program for making a lot of this work possible. Uh, next slide, please. So he here is the, the, the starting point. Here's a bowhead whale in Disco Bay in the west of Greenland. Uh, not my photo, not, none of the beautiful marine biology photos in this talk are my photos. Disco Bay is an especially important foraging site for the bowhead whales in the spring. It's especially the, the uh, mothers or the, uh, the expectant mothers who have come to, to fuel their pregnancies, basically. Uh, next slide, please. This is a better view of a, a bowhead whale. Again, not my photo. Uh, bowhead whales are the largest marine mammals in the Arctic. They can get up to 20 meters long. They can live for 200 years. They, they're known as the jazz musicians of the ocean with incredibly complex and diverse songs. And next slide. And the other critical fact about them is that they were very nearly hunted to extinction by the early 20th century. Now, since that time, some Arctic populations have rebounded. There are several different uh, distinct populations dotting the Arctic in a big ring, and some of them have rebounded quite well. The West Greenland stock is one of them, actually. But others remain critically endangered. And the question, of course, is, is what happens next? Next slide. It, it's impossible to think about the future of wildlife in the Arctic without thinking about the loss of sea ice associated with climate change. Th this is a, a graph, the, the latest projections, reconstruction and projections from the, the big report by the UN's IPCC uh, program. Th this report came out a couple of weeks ago. There was a flurry of news stories, but it deserves to stay in our minds. Um, so the black line there is what has already happened. This is the area of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean in September at the minimum uh, point in the the cycle of sea ice for the year. You can see we've already lost more than a third of it and are going to continue losing sea ice because of warming seas. But at the right there, that spray of colored lines, those are the possible futures. Those are the, the possibilities that are still left to us based on how seriously and quickly we get moving on, on carbon emissions. Next slide. But there's a difference in scale here. It, it's actually very difficult to connect this global view of uh, the state of the earth with the impacts on particular animals in particular places. So this talk is going to be short on hard answers and instead focus more on um, explaining how we frame the question. Next slide. So what I'd like to do is start from this moment this, this moment where these animals come to this place for a particular reason and expand outward in size and space and time. Next. So let's start with size. Next slide. Okay, why are the whales there? Why come to Disco Bay instead of someplace else? 
Next slide. The, the answer is these. These are Callinus copepods. They're really common zooplankton. It's amazing uh, how common they are relative to how few people have ever seen one. Uh, but they, they fill the Arctic oceans. They fill the North Atlantic oceans too. Actually, most of the oceans. Uh, these are just a few millimeters long and they're extremely energy rich. That, that oval running down the back of the animal is uh, just a, a, a sack of, of pure lipids. It's um, like tiny sticks of butter um, floating through the oceans. They're crustaceans. They're a relative of crabs and lobsters and shrimp, just quite small. Next slide. And to figure out how the whales are interacting with them, uh, my colleagues, people like Malena Simon in, in, Greenman, in Greenland, will go out on a small boat and follow behind the whales very slowly and carefully and take a really long, flexible, plastic rod with an acoustic tag at the end of it and carefully glue it to the whale's back. Next slide. And, and get views of their underwater behavior like this. This is the, the whale's depth in the water over the course of an hour. You can see it diving almost straight down, cruising really quite slowly for such a big animal along at maybe 80, 80 meters depth right above the seafloor, coming back up for a breath, going back down, cruising along again like that. Next slide. And th this is why they're doing it. At this time of year, this is early spring, and it's a time that the zooplankton, the, the calanus, the copepods, are still in hibernation. They hibernate in highly seasonal seas like the Arctic, and so they've sunk down to the bottom in a layer just a few meters thick. And a bowhead whale's mouth is a couple of meters across. So it's, it's kind of a precision operation, but assuming the whales can find the patches, which presumably they're very good at doing, although we don't know how they do it, um, they can get an incredibly dense meal here at the bottom of Disco Bay. Next slide. So let, let's finish the food chain. We have copepods in the middle, bowhead whales at the top, the top predator, and, next slide, feeding the copepods diatoms and other single-celled phytoplankton. Phyto just means plant-like, plankton means anything that drifts, uh, as opposed to being able to swim against the currents. And these diatoms are the, the, the source of a, a lot of the richness and the nutritional value that is, is packaged in those copepods for the bowhead whales. They're um, um, amazing things. They're single-celled, um, but they are uh, literally in glass shells that they make out of silicate um, extracted from the seawater, in, in, an incredible diversity of forms. And they can live in open water. They can also live in the sea ice itself, right at the interface of the ice and the water. Next slide. Now they're, they're single cells, but the largest of them are actually visible to the naked eye, just barely. These are about the biggest diatoms there are. Um, and uh, my friend and colleague, Naomi Yoder, took this photo. The, the background there is a two centimeter wide filter paper for extracting maybe a, a liter of seawater um, through a vacuum pump so you can uh, do microscopy on it. And here, with, just with a handheld SLR camera, she took a really excellent photo and you can, you can see their, their, their little glass shells there. Next slide. So that, that's the complete food chain, diatoms, copepods, bowhead whales. For an ocean food chain, it's actually quite a short one. To think about how strange this food chain really is, um, let's imagine an analogy magnified 500 times. Next slide. So magnified 500 times, 500 times bigger than a diatom is basically a blade of grass. 500 times bigger than a copepod is basically a sheep eating the grass. And then where does that leave bowhead whales? Next slide. Well, 500 times bigger than a bowhead whale is something like a city-sized UFO that comes along and, and sucks up sheep. It's, uh, there's really no analogy for it at all um, in the terrestrial realm.
Um, so th this analogy is, is meant first to point out that bowhead whales are, are even more amazing than they seem. And, and second, that an awful lot of the ecology of the ocean, an awful lot of the life and dynamics of the ocean is happening in that micro realm in which a two millimeter animal counts as, as large. Next slide. So with that in mind, let's, let's look at the, the ocean in this picture. Next slide. So bowhead whales cover a, a huge area over the course of the year. Uh, here's the results from another tagging study by Nielsen et al, where they tagged of uh, 39 whales that visited Disco Bay one spring, that's the, the end of the green lines uh, there pointing into Disco Bay and then followed them for a year. And you can see that they're, they're covering this whole area of the Eastern Canadian Arctic, thousands of kilometers. And when you consider how well and powerfully a, a, a 20 meter animal is able to swim, it's maybe not surprising that bowhead whales can get around that far. I mean, we know that birds can get around very far, um, salmon can migrate very far. What is surprising, next slide, is that the copepods are in their own way getting just as far over the course of a year. Now, copepods are plankton, which literally means that they cannot swim with the currents. They, they can't migrate in the conventional way. But one year of transport by the currents is represented by a, a kind of complex 3D ocean simulation gives this picture where arriving in the vicinity of Disco Bay, that black circle, there's Arctic zooplankton coming down from the north of Baffin Bay over quite a long distance. And then even more remarkable, more remarkable, there's this transport corridor, this highway around the, the Greenland continental shelf of Atlantic copepods that have traveled thousands of kilometers with the currents uh, just in the span of one year. Next, next slide. The, the reason that this is possible is that copepods live in the Arctic for a really long time. They're tiny animals, but they don't um, live a, a, a brief life the way we're accustomed to thinking of with insects. They have a, a life cycle of one or two or, or maybe even several years in these cold seas where it takes many different summers to accumulate enough phytoplankton to, to build a, a whole body. And that life, the long lifespan is the time lag that allows ocean currents to make these long distance links. Now, long distance links are not just uh, lines on the map, they're links to faraway climate impacts as well. Next slide, please. So let's reconsider this map in, in that sense, that what we're really seeing there carried by the copepods is climate dynamics, climate impacts, uh, coming from the Arctic and also coming from the open North Atlantic. Next slide. Now, not to go into too much detail about the nature of these impacts, because that really is where a lot of modern ongoing detective work is going. Uh, the, the key fact seems to be that the Arctic copepods are really highly adapted to ice covered seas. It really is their niche. And when you look at the underside of a patch of ice um, in, in spring, uh, you can start to see why. Um, this is, so this is now under the ice looking straight up. All of the green you see is phytoplankton that has found the perfect habitat there, right in the, the very stable uh, lowest down centimeter or millimeters um, of the ice there. You see this patchwork of light and dark. The light allows the phytoplankton to grow. The dark allows copepods and anything else that's eaten by fish to hide from visual predators. So it's a very complex habitat. And of course, the loss of sea ice is um, by far the, the biggest impact on, on their world. Next slide, please. I, I think the right way to, to think about this is that multi-year sea ice is something like an old growth forest. If ice is a forest, then the multi-year ice is the old growth forests that have had time to mature and develop a kind of spatial and ecological complexity that you just don't see in a, a younger system. Next slide. So 
when we look at these graphs of loss of sea ice, there's, there, there's two things going on, I suppose. We always look at the, these lines um, predicting the future of sea ice. It's almost always measured in the end of summer because uh, of, of course the Arctic is always going to be cold and dark in winter. There's always going to be ice on the Arctic Ocean in winter. What we're measuring is the fact that in future climate, either half of the persistent ice or basically all of it won't be there. It won't be able to persist in the way it does now. And that rich multi-year habitat for the plankton is the, the thing that's at risk. Next slide, please. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> okay. So in, in the Atlantic, let's, uh, Let's talk about that line of, of, of impacts. Th these are even more amorphous, and I haven't tried to um, go through the details in this talk, but, but to give the flavor of it, we can think of the, the plankton that are coming up around the tip of Greenland into Disco Bay, the, the red lines on the, um, on the uh, map I showed you before, as tendrils spinning off from the subpolar gyre. And subpolar gyre is a huge um, anti-clockwise circulation filling the, the top part of the North Atlantic. Um, it's bounded on the southern edge by the Gulf Stream and on the upper edge by, the, by Iceland and Greenland and so on. And sometimes, but not always, the ocean north of uh, the UK is basically an offshoot of it. Some years it isn't. Some years the water that comes up past us um, past Orkney and Shetland in the Faroes has come from the south and is carrying a different plankton community that is not nearly as energy rich and not the one that whales and salmon and, and so on are adapted to. But the, the key fact, I guess, is that there is this one set of currents that spins off these tendrils of plankton that feed everything from bowhead whales in West Greenland to cod in Iceland to the sand eels in the North Sea that in turn feed wild salmon smolts and seabirds and, and our local coastal ecosystems. From an oceanographic point of view, it is, it is one system and the, uh, the whales and our own seabirds have um, food dishes next to each other, I suppose. Next slide. And as far as climate impacts goes, well, th this is a rapidly evolving story. It's very hard to detect change in a system this big and this messy until after the change has happened. But we, what we do know is that changes in heat and freshwater at the northern end of the North Atlantic seem to be slowing down and reshaping that entire gyre. And these are, are changes that are going to affect everything from the weather in Europe to the, the food for bowhead whales in Greenland. Next slide. So finally, I, I want to tell you a, a historical story and think a little bit about a bowhead's view of time. Next slide. So let's switch location um, for the sake of a historical anecdote from Disco Bay over to Svalbard, um, otherwise known as Spitsbergen, up on the Norwegian side of, of the Arctic. Next slide. So here is a just a sample image from the Norwegian Meteorological Institute's ice service. Uh, if you're in Norway, then the, the weather service makes an ice forecast for you. And that's pretty important to things that the that uh, Norwegian boats are using the, the Met Office for. Uh, so this is just a sample image from this past June, to give you a sense of, of what it looks like. The warm colors there are dense ice coming down from the Arctic along the coast of, of East Greenland and around Svalbard, sort of wrapping around Svalbard from multiple directions at once. Uh, Svalbard is the hard to see gray triangle in, in the middle in the white circle. Next slide, please. Now, through some really impressive detective work, uh, a number of Norwegian researchers have reconstructed using old ship's logs, that kind of evidence, where that ice age was over the past 300 years. 
long before there was a Norwegian Met office. The, the way to read this graph, uh, so time over a few hundred years runs along the bottom. And the height of the bar is the position of the ice age. So the farther south it is, the lower the bar, the more ice there is coming down um, around Svalbard and beyond. Next slide, please. So over at the right of the graph, that's where roughly where we are now um, with ice um, leaving the top edge of Svalbard more often than not these days. And it's going to continue in that way as the, the pack ice of the Arctic uh, decreases, there will be more and more open water up that way. And how much farther up that way, of course, is the thing that we are choosing by climate action or inaction. But the interesting thing about this is that there was this other time in that dotted circle there at the end of the 1700s where the ice edge was roughly where it is today, not where it's going to be after further climate change, but where it is today. That has happened before. Next slide, please. And what happened during that time was the beginning of European whaling in the Arctic. Here's a, a painting from uh, a, a Dutch painter from the end of the 1600s up around Svalbard. Th this was the first time that the European powers expanded in that direction, partially because they could. There was actually open water that you could get a ship through up around the north end of Svalbard. But the other thing that we can now fairly confidently say must have been happening is that in that open water, there were new plankton blooms, new pathways for large phytoplankton and zooplankton populations to reach the coastal seas, the shallow coastal seas where bowheads like to eat, and the bowheads probably followed them there. So just as we see this surprising picture of whales and their prey converging in West Greenland in their annual routine, this moment in history was something like the whales and their predators, their human predators converging at the top end of Svalbard for the beginning of a, what for the whales was a, a really apocalyptic period of history. The, the whales around Svalbard were uh, more or less exterminated almost completely. And then um, whaling spread around Greenland and, and around the rest of the Arctic. Next slide, please. Now, normally we think of the year 1700 as being a long time ago. Um, it seems quite separated in time from the, the whales that are returning to, to Disco Bay now, just in the last few decades, really, after being absent for almost a century because their numbers were so depleted. But if you take a bowhead whale's point of view of this, I, I'm, I'm just struck again and again by the, the imaginative challenge of a 200 year lifespan for an animal that otherwise sees the world um, quite a bit like we do, I think. One bowhead whale lived through that, the, the, the dawn of, of whaling in Svalbard and the end of it, the, the disappearance of that stock. It only takes a couple of whale lifetimes to connect the beginning of this terrible era of, of history for those animals with where we are now. Next slide, please. In fact, it's a reminder that these long range projections we make when we talk about future climate change, those also, um, both the past and the, the future of those stories fit within one whale lifetime as well. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the world after the end of these projections, what's going to happen once we've gone through this um, deeply uncertain period of, of Earth history and come out the other side one way or the other. Well, we talk about that as science fiction. I've, I've plunked down the cover of Kim Stanley Robinson's New York 2140 with gondolas sailing through the, the canyons of what used to be Wall Street with sea level meters above where it is. For, for us, that's a distant, extremely hazy speculative future. But for those mother bowhead whales who are visiting Disco Bay right now, that entire future would, would just be retirement planning if they thought of it in those terms. And I think that's a real challenge to us to take that same perspective and require our decision makers to take perspectives like that as well. Next slide, please. 
So just to summarize, bowhead whales are even bigger than you might otherwise think in relation to the food web that sustains them. The, the North Atlantic Ocean is much smaller than it might look on the map, um, connected in a very material way by current systems and, and common populations of plankton. And the future is also coming much sooner than we might like to think as well. So I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Uh, that was fascinating. Um, and uh, I think the thing that struck me was the, um, was the food chain, you know, being so short. And um, in fact, we've got a few questions about that um, because it's, um, they rely on the copepods. Um, one question is, how do they detect them? And the other question is around competition. Um, you say that they're, they're sharing the same uh, food bowl as, as the birds, you know, um, could that make them um, more liable to extinction if there was a, you know, competitors or if something happened to the copepods? Yeah, the, the, those are both great questions. The question of how they detect the copepods, uh, I, I think we really have no idea. Um, we, we know that they are zeroing in, in on them very closely because of that combination of, of acoustic measurements of the, of the prey and the whales. And we can also do some uh, numerical calculations, guesses about their, their energy in, energy out, to, to know that they must be very efficient at finding the highest density patches for it to make sense. You know, they, they burn a lot of fuel staying warm in, in the Arctic. They have to be eating at a pretty high rate. How they find those patches, we, we don't know in a sensory way. Uh, as for the question about competition, um, yes, it's true that um, the whales are so efficient as predators that it does raise the possibility of, of trade-offs with other common taxa. In fact, there are some reconstructions that say when we look at places like Svalbard today with teeming seabird cliffs and, and um, uh, you know, huge numbers of walruses, um, that actually that is a system made possible by the elimination of the whales. And that if the whales were back at the numbers they were in, in the year 1500, there would still be birds and walruses in uh, Svalbard, but not the numbers we see today. Re reconstructing those historical changes is, um, is another really open frontier for this kind of research, I think. Okay, great. And then um, a question from Rich, he says, in your sea ice graph, what happened before 1950? Uh, well, the, the, the best estimates of that we have, you know, that there's no, uh, there's no way to add up sea ice over the entire Arctic hundreds of years ago. We can't reconstruct um, the fluctuations like that. But what we can reconstruct is the position of the ice in places that people went. So I, I think probably the time series of Ice Edge by Svalbard, and, and I would imagine, although I'm not really sure, some other records like that from other seas at the edge of the Arctic are the best reconstruction we have. So based on that evidence, um, the ice has fluctuated it goes up and down, uh, but there doesn't seem to be really a precedent for it retreating and retreating and continuing to retreat as fast as it's doing now. Okay, and that was interesting what you said that, you know, that the, the position of the edge of the ice um, was the same, like in 1700. Yeah, that's right. Just briefly though. Yeah. That, that was an extreme fluctuation at that time, as opposed to the, the average. Yeah, no. Um, I've got a couple of, I've got a comment and a question from Pia Casarini. Um, she says, excellent comparison um, of multi-year ice and an old growth forest. Um, and her question is, does the warming of the ocean cause the whales to migrate in different areas? That's a good question. Um, I would say bowhead whales, I believe that th this is getting beyond my expertise. I, I think the answer is that they tend to follow the ice age. At least that population in Eastern Canada over the course of a year is, is finding areas near the ice age as it goes along. 
Um, bowheads are specialized for cracking through the ice with these really solid foreheads. Um, and they're eating prey that also likes that marginal ice zone, that mix of, of, um, of patches of water and patches of ice. So if that were a general pattern, then you could make a, a, a prediction that with less ice, the whales will go where the ice age is. But the limits of that, as, as they have the choice between staying in the areas that they are used to over many years and many generations and moving to new areas, uh, it's, it's hard to know how they'll, they'll see the, that choice. And that has something to do with the plankton. Okay. And um, a question related to that, um, when the Gulf Stream is affected by climate change, is the polar current you describe going to still exist? Yeah, so the, the, the Gulf Stream, uh, th this is one of the, the climate stories that, that you, you hear popping up every now and then in the news. In fact, there, there was a, um, a new research paper and a new set of news stories just a couple of weeks ago about um, decline of the, the Gulf Stream. The, the current, the, the way I think of it is that the Gulf Stream is really two different things at once. The Gulf Stream is driven partly by the wind, the, the really large scale winds. And as long as the earth is rotating, um, there will be bands of wind, there will be currents that need to be closed by a Gulf Stream. It also is carrying the conveyor belt of heat north that balances the sinking of cold water going south. So if that, uh, if that transport of cold water south gets interrupted by changes like meltwater in the Arctic, it isn't that the Gulf Stream turns off completely, but it could turn off largely half of it. I mean, even, even a much smaller decline in the Gulf Stream than that is able to really disrupt the, um, both the weather patterns over land and the ecosystems that we're used to. So it, 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 it isn't an on or, or off thing, but this is one of the areas where um, people are monitoring long-term change in the currents that, that seems fractional, but seems to have big effects, and also are, are speculating about really catastrophic changes that you, you often don't hear scientists talk about in public much because you, you, you sound completely loony talking about the scale of change that could, could be caused by a disruption to that system. Yeah, I know. And then um, a question relating to um, the climate changes with the warming of the sea um, and oceans, um, the acidity is going to change. And could that affect the, um, the whales and where they uh, migrate and the, you know, the copepods are their food source as well? Yeah, th there's... Um... So ocean acidification does cause big ecological rearrangements in the plankton. Um, people try a variety of lab experiments to figure out what would the effect of more acidic seas be on this group of plankton and that group of plankton. I think the jury is still out on the effects, the, the direct effects on copepods. Overall, this, food, this particular food chain is not dependent on the classes of plankton that are most affected by acidification. The, the ones with calcium carbonate shells, um, uh, you know, relatives of, of the mollusks that we're used to basically, are, are the ones that are most uh, easily affected by acidification. So my, my quick guess, which very possibly history will make me regret, is that ocean acidification will not be um, top ranked in the, 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 the problems that, that these animals have to deal with. I think they've, they have bigger fish to pry. No pun intended. <laughs> That's great. And then um, how many um, bowhead whales are there at, at the moment? I believe it's that population. I, I, think, I think it's something like 1400 that visit Disco Bay over the course of a of a season. And there's a few other populations uh, around the Arctic. If, if I'm remembering the numbers right, and again, I could be completely wrong about this, um, the historical population was a few times what it is now for that population and, you know, astronomically bigger than the number of whales you find around Svalbard. Uh, I mean, people found 
maybe three bowhead whales in the vicinity of Svalbard a few years ago. And there was really tremendous excitement because people felt that they were completely gone. That's great. Good to hear. And um, Rich has um, picked up on your, um, your comment that um, the, the bowhead population has recovered um, around Greenland. Um, and he says, why has this happened? And is it simply just because there has been a ban on whaling? Yeah, that's right. That's right. They, they lived such a long time that the, re, that the recovery from whaling happens incredibly slowly. Um, and that's, that's exactly what's happening. They, there's food to eat, there's places to live, and they've been living there now for 100 years. They, um, they reproduce every few years, I think. So to build the numbers back up um, takes lifetimes. Um, but in places where the ocean continues to support the food chain that they need, um, and I, I suppose there aren't ongoing uh, habitat uh, disruptions, they're, they're perfectly capable of um, recovering over the next centuries from the centuries of whaling if climate change doesn't pull the rug out from under their feet. And then um, thinking about other threats, um, obviously the oil and gas exploration um, would have played a part in you know, the threats to the, to the whales. Um, what about the um, impact of potential undersea mineral and exploration and exploitation? That's a good question. Um, I don't really know. I, I, I think that those, those impacts are, they're really mediated by behavior. Uh, that would be my guess. That, that it, you know, the, the, the direct effects of undersea mining on, um, on a, a food chain that goes through the seafloor, for example, um, walruses that eat clams, that eat phytoplankton that have rained down to the bottom. Th those are direct and material. And the kinds of computer models we have can do a decent job of, of working out all of that, the, the energetic ins and outs of, of those things. You lose this much habitat, you lose this many clams, the walruses have this kind of foraging problem. With something like a bowhead whale, when we're talking about these other changes to the habitat, I think it really is, um, I think you have to understand whale psychology and behavior to see how they're going to react to something new and strange um, and potentially dangerous appearing um, somewhere in their habitat. Um, maybe, maybe people who know the whales better than I do could answer that now, um, but I, I can't. Um, and I loved your expression about them being, um, did you say they were the jazz stars of the ocean? Yeah, yeah, there, there was a, um, uh, some, some work done about a decade ago that just found hundreds of different songs um, being sung. Uh, they're, they're, they they uh, sing continuously through the mating season as, as you might see in other whale populations, but instead of the, the story of, that you hear with um, say humpback whales where there is a song for the season and it's repeated with variations, they seem to just make up something new every year. <laughs> With this huge variety. That sounds great. Um, but a question about the about the because they're so reliant on these um, noises and uh, music that they make. Um, could undersea noise pollution play a part in uh, the portfolio of threats? You know, to the whales. It could. Again, that's that's not the the angle that that I can speak about whales from, but I I would imagine so. I've um, got another one here, got very busy on the questions. Um, I was going back to um, the um, talking about the recovery um, around Greenland and um, about the ban on whaling. What, what was meant was, um, are we dealing with a cycle or a linear loss? Uh a cycle or a linear loss in the whales or the habitat for the whales? Um, I think it's the whales, but maybe um, Eric can cl clarify that for me. Um, it was when, we, when we asked the question about, um, you know, did, did they recover because of the ban on whaling? Um, the person's just added that what they meant, are we dealing with a cycle 
you think is a cycle as opposed to a linear? I, I, I think that if we maintain the ban of, on whaling, um, the whales will continue to recover in a linear way, a, a linear and tapering off way, way until we see the carrying capacity of their habitat. Right, right now, um, I think at, everywhere in the Arctic, they are nowhere near the carrying capacity of their habitat. They're not near their historical numbers. Those oceans can support many more whales than are in them. And the level of industrial slaughter at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s. It's not part of any cycle. I, I think you could safely say that nothing like it has ever happened to that population of whales. So uh, yes, I think it really is one down and one up, okay. um, unfolding just over a, what for us is a very long time and for the whales is not a very long time at all. And perhaps you maybe can't answer this, but um... I think there's, there's concern um, that with it being such a short food chain, um, if the copepods suddenly disappeared, say there was a, I don't know, a disease or something like that, could the, could the whales, you know, could they adapt? Could they eat, you know, the different species? That's an interesting question. Um, in, in temperate seas, the copepods are one abundant group of plankton, but really one of, of many. In the Arctic, they are incredibly dominant numerically, and not just copepods, but Callinus copepods, this particular cluster of species, they, they will just fill uh, a net that's sampling a full water column for plankton. So what the Ar Arctic Ocean would look like without Callinus is an interesting speculative question. Something would come along to fill that niche, something would come along to eat phytoplankton, but it's hard to imagine what it would be like. Um, they, Calinus can be locally depleted, um, like, like other plankton, I suppose, but I think that they, they, they also have an incredible ability to recover. They, they are food for everything in the North Atlantic and the Arctic. Um, and they, their, their normal way of being is to, um, you know, be more than 99% consumed and then the, that tiny fraction of survivors rebuild the population the next year. So the, the copepods, I think, are resilient to the limit of the, the habitat itself. Um, big fat copepods that require ice, anything like that will also require ice, I suppose. It's really a matter of replacing one kind of, of ocean plankton community with another and asking whether a southern zooplankton community will um, give, be able to give the whales what they need. I'm completely fumbling because this is such a, a challenge to um, what we are able to observe that it's um, just a long chain of, of what ifs. Yeah, that's true. And it's possible if, you know, if the ocean currents do change that some of the ones from further south may come north you know, and fill that gap. I there, guess there, you're, there's you're, plankton you're everywhere. Say so much. Sorry. Sorry? Uh, your computer models can only give you an indication of what might happen. Yeah, or you know, people try to um, do a, 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 a take a comparative approach and say, well, what if the future Arctic is more like the middle of the North Atlantic? Um, but it isn't quite that simple because the the thing that doesn't change the reason that you can't just have communities um, move on the map but otherwise stay the same is that the Arctic is really dark for a lot of the year. And there will always be a time of year, long period of the year that phytoplankton don't grow. So this is the kind of speculative question that we aim at with models, but I don't think we're there yet. Okay. And uh, finally, just a couple of questions on, uh, on the whales themselves. Um, what are the natural predators? And do you think that the ocean plastic um, has any impact on them? Hmm. Ocean plastic, I'm not sure. I would guess that there are other whales that are more vulnerable to plastic, uh, just because being low on the food chain, even if you're a huge animal, um, is a benefit usually when it comes to um, uh, toxics in the ocean, for example. And the scale that they're eating on, I don't think is the scale where you would see replacement of their prey. 
Um, I, I think that the ocean plastics problem is probably the biggest concern for longer food chains where the copepods are eaten by small fish that are eaten by big fish that are eaten by seals that are eaten by polar bears, for example. Okay. Um, and I missed the first question. What was the first question? It was, um, what's their natural predators? Um, killer whales, for example? Yeah, killer whales will go after bowheads. Okay. And us, apparently. <laughs> Hopefully not anytime soon. Um, well, thank you very much, Neil. Um, that was a fascinating talk. And we look forward to maybe hearing more of your research in the future, because I know that you've been to the Science Festival before. So we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. Um, thanks to all our viewers um, for all the questions. Um, your feedback is much appreciated. So if you have time, please fill out our feedback form in the description. And our next talk today is the shape of the coast at five o'clock the shaping of the cliffs and the shore of the West Mainland of Orkney. So that would be a great interest to me. And at half past seven, we have clues to whiskey flavour. And at half past eight, we have the closing Cayley in the Festival Club. So um, please do come along to the closing Cayley at half past eight, where we, we've got lots of musicians um, and chat and fun to be had. And if you like the festival, Please like us on social media um, and also our YouTube channel and uh, like and subscribe and you'll also see any recordings that you may have missed. So thank you all again and goodbye.